Broadway, there's Off Broadway, and then there's the Wooster Group, which began doing its cutting edge multimedia nonlinear theater in the adventurous 70s, but didn't sell out when the rest of us did. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic and arts columnist of Newsday. And our guest is Kate Valk, who was an NYU student when she wandered into the Soho warehouse on Wooster Street and stayed to co-create decades of internationally acclaimed, always new theater. How do you stay alive? <laughs> Do you, are, is it amazing to you that you're still doing the same thing that you were doing then? Mm, amazing, yes. Uh, um, uh, surprising, no, because uh, there's n there was no other choice really but to go, once I found the performing garage in the Worcester Group, uh, there was no place I'd rather be. You just walked in there and you said, I'm home, I'm here. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, when I was a student, uh, I had studied uh, acting at NYU undergrad drama through the studio program. So I had been at Stella Adler for two years, Ooh. which was, I had a fantastic yeah. time. It was a great group of people and the the instructors there were wonderful, a voice and Shakespeare and, and Stella was such a, a magnificent character and um, I mean every class with with her was like a performance it was great but I didn't know what I was gonna do I didn't I didn't I, kn I knew I was having a great time at school but I thought am I gonna get a picture and a resume and try and get a job I didn't have that kind of um, ego that uh, to be able to um, believe in myself enough to do that. I didn't, uh, I didn't have that kind of outward confidence at that time at all. I was looking for a way to live my life and be able to make work. And uh, I wanted to make, make things more than I wanted to be an actress. So I was very fortunate to um, after two years in the Adler program, I still, I was a transfer student, so I had a, another semester to do if I, if I wanted to graduate. So I, they had this new program, ETW, Experimental Theater Wing, uh, and this is, at NYU. And yeah, it was this just, is Richard Sheshner at the Performing Garage, or not? No, you no. didn't have anything uh, to do with Sheshner? No, it was the Worcester Group. It was the Worcester Liz. Group was already doing it. Okay, great. Yeah, no, no. They had different art, real artists who were making theater work with the small group of students who made up the experimental theater oh, okay. wing. That's great. And the, and the semester I was there, I was just lucky enough that it was the Worcester group who was working with the group that I was in. It was a group of maybe 10 uh, students. And so I met uh, Elizabeth LeCompte, who was directing the pieces, Spalding Gray, Spalding Gray. Ron Vauder, Willem Dafoe, Libby Howes. And they had already made Rumstick Road, a uh, Sakana Point, Rumstick Road, and, and, and Nay at School in that order. And they were working on Point Judith. And I, um, I went to the, uh, I enjoyed working with them so much. We made a, a little film in an elevator that we incorporated into some scenes in, in the, that were totally defined by the room we were working in at NYU. And it was so exciting. And then I went to the garage and saw the pieces, and then I knew I, this is where I wanted to work. I just knew it. It was deeply intuitive. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I found that situation. Because I, what I have, and why I, I've been there for 25 years, and I hope I have another 25 years, or we'll see, we'll, we'll see what happens, is that I, I have an artistic home. And that's something that uh, uh, I don't take for I don't take for granted. You didn't want to bring your three audition songs and your tap shoes over to. Well, first of all, <laughs> I can't carry a tune. Perfect. And and I you know I, I love to dance, but um, I, I wasn't um, I wasn't a skilled practitioner in that way, like a song and dance person. And, and I was lucky I found this group of artists who were interested in, in um, all aspects 
that everybody you were you could be a theater artist in in the true sense of a word in a group that has a place to work so you can dedicate yourself to the time and place and that's that's really that's not the so much uh, what makes up the business of theater yeah. you have to work so fast yeah. so I found the right the right uh, time frame for myself with this group of people but in the 70s this was a lot of people were doing this there were more groups there were more groups that, there was more encouragement for it it seemed I would think to be um, a more probable or more possible place to find a home yes but then we went through a couple decades where it was it isolating to be doing this kind of work when when it became quite less than welcome in New York much more successful in Europe well, yes. we, we ended up uh, during that period performing in Europe uh, most of the year. As a matter of fact, a, a consortium of European producers got together and, and in essence, commissioned a couple of our pieces, uh, uh, almost three of them, which means instead of funding from this country, uh, from private or, or government sources, uh, the Europeans were funding us. So we were obligated to do a lot of touring, and we were better known in Europe. I mean, but there's a, there's a history of that uh, for all artists. Think of all the great musicians and writers that went to live in, in, in Europe for yeah. various reasons, because the, it, it's a different regard and a different yeah, but what support happened? structure. Why did it become so conservative here? I think we're actually getting out of it now. Do you, am I, am I wrong? I, I think that actually the atmosphere for your kind of work has actually, is, is much brighter and, and more comfortable now than it was for a while. Am I just watching it from uptown? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, mean, you've I think it, been you, you have to look at the you have to look at how things are made probably, um, and if the economics of how they're made have has it really changed, then it's the surface. So uh, I think maybe the the when uh, when it becomes cost prohibitive to operate the way we do, uh, and the way uh, groups uh, can make work. Uh, and, and not that there isn't a definite hierarchy in the way we work. It's not like we're, you know, a, a collective where it, it all shifts around. Like when I say group, it's not so much that. It's just that uh, we commit to uh, making work together, and um, we can, can let it happen in its in its own time because we have the place. So if the yeah. real estate is so tight, if it's so expensive for people to um, live in the city and, and, and they're not supported so much uh, from the businesses or the, the government, then, then it becomes harder and harder. I and also think maybe a sensibility, you know, became sort of dysfunctional family place with individual pathologies was sort of what I would see five times a week. Um, and, and then we're, really, we're, of, of the original pe people, of the groups that were the so-called avant-garde in the 60s and 70s, your, your group, Mabel Mind, Richard Foreman, that's it? Yeah. Yeah. And is it surprising that more didn't survive? I think I mean, it's, I think, the, just the how the sort of psychic space in the city tightened up. Yeah. It, 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 it became <laughs> yeah. expensive. Uh, there just it, it's there's just not as much room. There's not literally the places for mm. people to to meet and not worry about how they're going to pay exorbitant yeah. rents. And it hasn't quite shifted over into something like. Uh, Harvey Lichtenstein wants to do in Brooklyn around BAM yes. uh, because it, it has to be supported by money first instead of people coming in and making the work and then 
it, it grows organically like that. It's just a different time in the city. But but the but the exciting innovations are probably there. They are. They're happening in in a different way. They're happening on the internet, on the computer, on these other kind of connections. Now you guys were were really interested in technology early. <laughs> you have, it sounds so old-fashioned to say they're multimedia shows because it sort of seems like a time, but you, the way that you use uh, the screens and sound and everything, you guys had these toys and were playing with them very early, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, that's Liz. I mean, she okay. loves Elizabeth Lecomte. All right, this is Elizabeth Lecomte. She is the director of all the shows. Yes. And... Um, she has a, her relationship with Willem Dafoe, who's also... It's, I have to say this because I, something everybody was asking me when I said I was going to be talking to you was, well, gee, do you think Wooster Group would have, would have been able to exist if Willem Dafoe hadn't had movie money? Oh, right. You see? Yeah. Uh, and I think, well, that's a little, a little ungracious of me to ask, but I think, how necessary is that? Uh, it's not necessary. It's definitive, yeah. but it's not necessary. We were working together before Willem made a film, and if he stopped making films, we would still work together. Um, but it's definitive. It's a, it's allowed us. Um, I mean, he he by no means supports the company. It's not a vanity theater company. It's not like that. I mean, we make. It's his home, right? Uh, it's yeah. He's an artistic member. I mean, he's um, uh, he's the Worcester Group. Yes. And um, but we'd still uh, we we'd still we had the garage, we had the place to work, and we had the commitment to the work before he made a single movie. And his uh, his work in the films and his renown. Of course, it's it's uh, the movies are very powerful. Yeah. There is, is a magnet for it's a it's charisma. It's it it brings people to our work, but um, the work exists above and beyond that that celebrity. Can we talk a little bit about process now? These these are called works in progress, forever. No, <laughs> no, just while while we're making them. while you're making yes. them. And then at some point you just, you say it's done. At some point it's done, and because we're on to the next thing and it's completed itself in terms of. But structure. then you may several years later come back to it. Yeah, and there you know when, for instance, we remounted Brace Up. Brace Up, which is the three over, sisters. De yes, our version of the three sisters, yes. and uh, we we remounted it after over a decade, and we had uh, some cast changes. Some people had died, and. Uh, the people had changed, and and a few new people came in, but it was um, it was the same show with these minor changes to allow for the new breath inside of it, the new the new life it was taking on. Brace up, two thousand three, you know, as opposed to when we did it in the early nineties. But um, it, it, that's living. I mean, theater is a living medium. It doesn't exist outside of the live event. So um, it wasn't a museum piece, so it, it had a new life, so it, it was different, but the structure was the same. And how long do you work on them? That, again, is defined by the material. Some of the pieces we've made in weeks, and other of the pieces, uh, it's been a year. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're sort of famous for working for long time so oh you, yeah you, we do have yeah. a long uh, comparatively my goodness to how most people make theater but uh, not to somebody like Richard Foreman who uh, if you count it all I mean he works intensely inside a uh, period of time he doesn't keep a company together all the time either uh, or but but we um, we will work for a while, and then we'll go out on, t on tour with uh, one of the pieces in repertory. And then we'll come back and work. So if you add it all the time together, you know, it's anywhere from, I would say, six weeks to eight or nine months. And when, um, do you call what you do deconstruction? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> 
But I, I can, I can understand. I mean, what does that term mean to you, deconstruction? Where well, you take something apart and find out what's inside yeah. the cracks? Well, or, well, then yes, maybe. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> we were accused once of cannibalizing the text. Was that was that by some famous playwright? <laughs> uh, was that Arthur Miller? No, I don't oh. think I don't think that was Arthur Miller. Now Arthur Miller got really upset because you were using pieces of 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 the Crucible. Of the Crucible, we did a, a, a condensed version of the Crucible, just the high points that we did performed as a theatrical event while we were making the rest of the piece. Um, and uh, yes, uh, if he came down. He was bemused. We were served a cease and desist by his literary agent. Mm -hmm. um, who, who, who knows what, what was going on with him, yeah. his career, and what the rights, literary rights, and 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 the and the use of a playwright's work. Probably, if we had never asked for the rights, there wouldn't have been a problem. But uh, I think he was wanting, I think uh, when I look back on it, I think he really desired to have uh, what he considered, you know, a first class production of the play in New York City. So he, I think, wanted control of that. So and here are these people playing with it somewhere else, you know, doing their own, their own theater from it. Yes, yes, yes. Using it as a, the centerpiece to even a larger examination of uh, the themes or, or the time period. So it's easier with dead playwrights. Yes. Uh, you know, yes, you're, yes, you're yes. You're doing your check off and you, yes, you've done the O'Neill and, yeah. You might consider uh, the way Liz puts the pieces together to be a collage or bricolage or um, some synthesis of many different source materials. Um, so yes, it's it, it's it, it's if you look at it from an uh, an art tradition or what's happening in in the plastic arts or the visual arts, you can come into it a little easier. When you're coming from theater, where um, it's a literary theater, uh, the 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 words of the playwright are what you're upholding, as you that's what you're interpreting. Uh, a lot of theater. Um, that that we see is from that tradition, and you're upholding and interpreting the words of the playwright. So there's something sacrosanct about even, uh, you know, cutting and pasting a little, or condensing, or paraphrasing, or or something like that. And and for us, we have to have all those options available because we have to figure out how we're going to make it live. Um, so you and, can do and it's art. a different way. Yeah. It's a, it, we're, Liz is looking. She's looking for what the living metaphor is, how we can hear it and see it in this day and age uh, in relationship to what its tradition might be or what its history might be, but trying to make it resonate now in how we live our lives. Oh, I think they're incredibly powerful. I, I love them. And, um, and uh, yet I could see why somebody who had a script may, you know, might say, wait a minute, that's mine. But um, to you, Bertie, Phaedra. To, to, <laughs> to you, the Bertie. To you, the Bertie. Yes. To you, the Bertie um, was, was a Wooster thing on, um, on Racine. It was our version of Your version Racine's Phaedra. Of Racine Phaedra. And, and, and in fact, you were the queen. Yes. And, um, and, and, I was Someone, the embodiment the embodi of the queen. The embodiment of the queen. It would okay. be a, 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 a Scott Shepard and I uh -huh. were the queen. He was the voice of the queen for the most part, and I was the embodiment in uh, that was in that construct. How did you come up with the with? How did anyone decide that they should be, you know, using a metaphor of bad badminton <laughs> for Fedra? Uh, you know, this is uh, perhaps I'm just you know, being naive. But where does it come from? Oh, well, that, that, um, that was, the badminton was Liz's idea. And uh, we were working on a new set. We were going to have, and she was designing an, a new 
uh, construction for the space. We'd been on the same set for 15 years, this steel construction uh, in many different configurations. Uh, uh, she would change it around for each of the pieces. But we were starting on the bare floor with this one. And uh, uh, so oftentimes we'll, we'll have some game or some uh, physical thing we're working on or dances that we're making f uh, without regard to what text material we might be working on. And it's something to do physically in the space. So the space is kinetic. And uh, we, she, she I, I don't know why she thought badminton, but she did. I mean, she loves it. And uh, also we played ping pong for a while, too, because that was a wonderful um, uh, metaphor about um, the back and forth of the language. Uh, or just, or just the physics of a of a space and the game. I don't know. It just worked right away from the beginning, and uh, I mean, there, it, it resonated on a lot of different levels. It, it gave us something to do, to uh, when we couldn't face the text, because for us with the Racine, it was very uh, Paul Schmidt's adaptation and translation is very, very different than uh, Racine's Alexandrine rhyming couplets. His, uh, he had dispensed with that poetry and he made it very succinct, modern language. Plain, 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 and very succinct. So, um, and and it, was, it was hard to reconcile the huge proportion of the drama, without which the story isn't really that taboo anymore. A, a woman s t tries to seduce her stepson. I mean, that, we're n it's not that taboo. It's on law and order. It's <laughs> everywhere all the time. I mean, uh, uh, it just doesn't have the same tragic impact. So, but, but unless it's, it's on that mythical level with uh, that huge, huge scale, and then there was the language, very mundane. So we had a hard time reconciling the two. So it gave us something, the badminton gave us something to do during that. And plus, it's the game. You know, it's yeah. the game. It's is Venus is the referee. It's a beautiful, these, it's the court. These are very, very serious pieces. It's love. It's but the, there's always a sense of play mm -hmm. that must be lovely. When you had, in, in, um, in the Phaedra, Francis McDormand was there. You don't usually have guest artists, or maybe not not well known ones, so that you probably have people all the time. But how hard it is is it to integrate somebody into into your style, into your heads? Um, that uh, that depends on the person and what we're doing. I mean, with Fran, it was fantastic yeah, because I, she was coming to us with a from. Uh, the world of films, I mean, she's worked on the stage a number of times. She certainly, I mean, yeah. I think that's why she was attracted to working with us, is the physicality of our theater and the kinetic quality of our theater. Or, or, and, and it's funny because she and I are, are just a couple months apart in age, and we, but we come from such different uh, backgrounds in terms of Where the work from? we've been making. Where are you from? Uh, Baltimore. And so you grew up in Baltimore, and you thought you were going to be an actress. No, I, I, I grew up all around. We'll do a little bio now. This is the little bio. <laughs> I grew up all over, really. Yeah. We, we hopped around a lot when I was growing up. So Spokane, Washington, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Catasauqua, Pennsylvania. No. No, just and, hopping around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, junior high and high school in Baltimore. And, the, and I came to New York because I wanted to come to the big city. You know, I wanted to... I just had I just had to come to New York. And there, and do you miss the Soho that was? Um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'm, but I miss it because it was so wonderful. I mean, I love I love what I'm doing now and the people I work with now. But uh, oh yes, for me that was a very special time. Do you um? Do you ever go to the theater? Like oh yeah, every uh, do you, I mean uptown theater? Do you go to conventional theater? If I have if um, if there's something I really want to see, or if somebody I know is in something, or what's the last somebody 
Oh, that's a good oh, question. Oh, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't remember the last thing I saw. <laughs> it's been a while, I'll so, tell you. What was the last thing I saw? Well, I'm thinking of the uh, Russian play that uh, Alan Bates was in with uh, oh, yeah, yeah, Frank yeah, Langella, yeah, right, right. because uh, Lola Pashalinsky oh, right. is a friend of okay. mine. <laughs> now, keeping the group together must be very important. It is seems to me to be family-like and not Manson family-like. <laughs> 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 um, and and Spalding Gray left really to do more of his own things, right? Mm -hmm. And then Ron Water, much loved, died. And then um, so was is it scary when somebody goes? Um, you know, how much does how important is it to keep the core? Do you add to the core? Are there new core people in the core? Um, well, how important? Is it to keep the core? Uh, who's the person with the ability to keep the core? I mean, the core just is. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just is. I mean, uh, I don't think that's something that we can control, even if you will. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're really, really. It's like we operate like a real traditional theater company, like. Um, uh, I imagine what the Brecht or Moliere or maybe even Shakespeare that it's it's this people who stay together because of the work and people come and go people die people go crazy new people come and uh, it's just been this way so if the core changes then it it has to change because yeah. it has to. Um, it's really been wonderful having you here. It's, it's very inspirational to hear people who actually stay, do love, love what they're doing, know that it's the right thing, and then the world just comes to them, which is, I believe, what happens with you, with your group. But um, thank you so much, thank Kate you. Ball. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Um, and thank you for being here. On behalf of the League of Professional Theater Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theater.